This one, this time. Hallelujah, the microphone. This one and this one. <laughs> All right, well, it's By Whose Influence Are We Being Shaped? Series 6 and Part 4. And as we stated last week, if we're beginning to see and understand the Scriptures that we've been looking at, then we'll see that we are not destined for infirmity. We're destined for results. Amen? And listen, the spirit of a man shall sustain him in sickness. That's Proverbs 18, 14, which reads, The strong spirit of a man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble, but a weak and broken spirit who can raise it up or bear. So what is this scripture telling us today, body of Christ? Well, it's telling us that our spirit man will minister to our outer man, our flesh. Hope you catch that. That our spirit man will minister to our outer man, our flesh, with regard to the characteristics of the ministry of love. And that love will restore the missing ingredient, strength. Both physical strength and spiritual strength. So when you're having a bad day, when you're feeling weak and tired, hello, begin to minister to yourself by rejoicing. Just start by ministering to the Lord. Try focusing as difficult as it may seem or be at that time, but compel yourself to sing praises unto the Lord. And your joy will begin to be restored. And what you'll do is you will lift yourself up out of whatever it is that is troubling you or ailing you. Yes. So the question is for us today, just whose influence then has the preeminence in our day? What is the major influence in and of your day? Think about that for a moment when you are down and depressed? By whose influence are you being shaped in that day? There are many, many influences that are bearing down on us every single day. So we have to make a choice. We have to choose what is influencing us in our current day. Our decision is, to which one of these are we going to give the preeminence? in our day. We need then to recognize the value of the Lord's strength in our day. That's powerful. That statement is very, very powerful. We need to recognize the influence of the Lord's strength in our day. <clears throat> and the question is, and where does that joy come from? comes from the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And if you remember last week, we spoke about the strongest man in the Bible, the strongest person in the Bible, Samson. And of course, there was a little giggling going on. Yes. But his joy, the joy of the Lord was his strength. You know how this ring is a sign of my covenant with my wife? Well, his long hair was a sign of the covenant with his God. <clears throat> he didn't get his strength from his hair. He got his strength from his covenant and the joy of the Lord. So rejoicing, as we said last week, rejoicing is refueling. Refueling with the substance of strength, which is joy. And we find that in Proverbs 17:22 that it enforces this theme for it tells us there that a happy heart is good medicine, and listen, and a cheerful mind works healing. A cheerful mind works healing, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Yes. That a joyful heart does good like a medicine. And the word there in the Greek is shemech, 
Shemech. So a joyful heart does good like a medicine. And as we've also stated before, it is the substance of strength. So in the Hebrew, then, the implication is that joy is actually medicine for your heart's strength. That's the way it's put. Strength in and for the spirit, as well as your physical body. Now, I want us, if we could, to go to Psalm 42. Well, I'll, let me, I'll just mention that to you. But before we do that, I've got a little bit more to say. Okay, so uh, let me do this. <laughs> Get my paperwork sorted out here. Proverbs 15, 13. Let's go there first. Proverbs 15, 13 states... Now, this is something we need to meditate on and richly implant it into our hearts. Proverbs 15, 13 states, A glad heart makes a cheerful what? Countenance. Countenance. But by sorrow a heart, the spirit is broken. By, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. See that? So a joyful heart makes a cheerful countenance. And the word countenance there doesn't just mean the look on the surface of your face. As in your countenance. But it also refers to the way things look. Now catch this. It refers to the way things look and how you perceive your circumstances. See that? So a joyful heart makes a cheerful countenance. So a joyful heart actually reflects itself in your countenance, referring to the way you look at things and perceive things and circumstances. So what this is saying to this body of Christ is that having a joyful heart will affect the circumstances as to the way we look at the things in our lives. Now, we've said before, we've said this before, as to how things begin to look a little bit different through the eyes of joy. You look at something when you're sad and you can't see it. You look at something when you're full of joy and you can see much more than what you're looking at. And things may not change straight away, but joy begins to change the way that things appear. Yes. So what the writer of Proverbs is saying to us here today, body of Christ, is that joy, joy actually changes the way that we see things. The way that we see things. This then is what is meant, listen, this is what is meant by a cheerful heart changes the countenance. A cheerful heart changes the way that we see things. So what we're attempting to do in these lessons is to try and create a dialogue between the spirit and the flesh using what? The characteristics of love. Now the cry of the voice of your earth, the cry of the voice of, voice of your earth this then is that of deep calling to deep. Now I want you to turn to Psalm 42 and verse 7. And I pulled this one out. We're going to pick up at verse uh, 5. And because it tells us exactly what joy will do in changing the countenance and the outlook of your lives. Of your lives. You turn to Psalm 47, and we'll look at verses 6, six through 11. Psalm 42. Uh, Psalm 42. What did I say? 47. Huh. Yeah, Psalm 42, 6 and 11. Sorry. 
Mm -hmm. Now this is a song, is it not? Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your trust in God. So he said, why are you so cast down, O oh my inner self? And why should you moan over me and be disquieted within me? Hope in God and wait expectantly for him. For I will yet praise him, my help and my God. Oh my God, my life is cast down upon me and I find the burden more than I can bear. Therefore, I will earnestly remember you from the land of the, of the Jordan River and the summits of Mount Hermon and from the little mountain Mizar. Roaring deep calls to roaring deep as the thunder of your water spouts, all your breakers and your rolling waves have gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the nighttime his song shall be with me and a prayer to my God of my life. I will say of my God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I mourn because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword crushing in my bones, my enemies taunt and reproach me while they say constantly to me, where is your God? Why are you cast down on my inner self? And why should you mourn over me and be disquieted within me? Hope in God and wait expectantly for him. For I shall yet praise him who is the help of my what? Countenance and my God. So what does joy do? It changes the countenance. Amen. So as I say, we need to work at, at, on establishing a working dialogue because there's a dialogue that takes place. We are not aware of it, but there's a dialogue that takes place. Here we are, we downcast, right? Here we are, we downcast and we begin to worship and praise God. And as we worship and praise God, there's a dialogue going on between the, the spirit, the flesh and God. And he comes and refreshes our soul, which changes the countenance, which brings back the joy. Yes. We are refueling our strength. Amen. And this is what we've been trying to emphasize, that at times our earth, our physical bodies are and have been crying out from the very substance of our being. And that our bodies recognize, our bodies recognize that the word that's contained within it, within our bodies, isn't being joined together in the agreement of the word of our spirit. So consequently, there's a corruption of sorts of the word, or if you will, a violation of the word concerning some element of our physical being. And what happens? We become sick. Because there's a corruption of the word that is in our, within our bodies. From that of the intended original creation blueprint of the Father. If then we're made out of the word, uh, do we understand that, that by now? That the word became flesh and dwelt among us? John, 1 John 114 or John 14 no. First John 114. Ha! Huh. Then the original, listen, the original formation of physical man was that of intended health and strength. We have been returned to that in and through Christ. So there are two words in the Greek that describe the word for word. Right? They describe the word for word. They are rhema and logos. Rhema and logos. Now, the word rhema is translated usually to mean a spoken word, the rhema of God. The word logos, though, has a broader and more philosophical meaning, for it usually carries with it the implication of the total message, i.e., 
If you turn with me to Luke 4, when you finish writing there, turn to Luke 4, and we'll look at verses 1, 31 and 32. Luke 4, verses 31 and 32. Are you there yet? Yeah. Luke 4, 31 and 32, Mary. And he, this is Jesus, and he descended to Capernaum, a town of Galilee, and there he continued to teach the people on the Sabbath days. And they were amazed at his teaching. For his word was with authority and ability and weight and power. See that? So the word logos then in John 1 is referring to Jesus. And Jesus, listen, Jesus is the total message if we want to understand everything and everything about God, the Father, then we need to understand precisely who Jesus is. Because Jesus is the total message in so much that Jesus is everything that Father God wants to communicate to mankind. So what we must begin to see is that there needs to be an agreement, an agreement between the two, an agreement between the physical and the spiritual. See, when we think of Jesus walking the earth, we never think of that. We never think of that or see that, that with Jesus walking the earth, in his manifestation of the Word made flesh, he was representing the total agreement that we need between the spirit and the flesh. When these two agree, then there's dialogue or a discourse that takes place. We've spent time in this series talking about the voice of the flesh, the voice of the body, and we've also talked about the answer or the response of the spirit to or of that cry from the flesh. For instance, we feel nauseated, feverish, and we have a splitting headache. What if anything is our flesh trying to communicate to us? Something's wrong. It's trying to communicate us to, that we're not well. An action needs to be taken to rectify the situation. We've probably been ignoring it. Ignoring the warning signs that, have, that we've been overdoing it. Right? Neglecting ourselves, i.e. Not, not enough sleep. Not eating right. Not exercising. <laughs> Pesky little fly. Not exercising. <laughs> Too much junk food, etc. There is then an answer of the Spirit that will meet the need often from the voice of the flesh. We just need to learn how to hear and how to listen to the voice of the flesh. And we also have to become aware of the spirit. We've been, been talking about this, you know, in Navigators and, and here in um, by whose influence are we being uh, shaped. We need to become more spiritually aware. More spiritually aware each and every moment of each and every day. It's so important. We get so carried away with the ways of the world throughout our daily lives that we forget this basic information, this basic communication that needs to take place between our spirit and our flesh. 
every single day. Amen. This is why the Apostle Paul states in Colossians 4, 6. If you want to go there. Colossians 4, 6. Now, we've also mentioned in this series, speaking in tones of grace or grace tones. Learning how to speak in grace tones to our flesh and grace tones to all and to everything. In, in Colossians 4, 6, it says, let your speech at all times be gracious. See that? Tones of grace. Yes. Pleasant and winsome, seasoned, persevering, wholesome. Hmm. That, listen, to do that, to speak like that, to act like that, takes a knowledge of language. Not the language you're speaking, but the language of God, the language of love. Particularly the language of the Spirit. Now, if you want to turn with me to Ephesians now, Ephesians 6, 18. This also tells us to do something. Ephesians 6, 18. Now, when you're praying, are you speaking? Yeah. You are, aren't you, when you're praying? So in Colossians, it tells us to let our speech at all, by, at all times be gracious. And in Ephesians 6, 18, the Apostle Paul is telling us, pray at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the Spirit. So how are we to pray? In the Spirit. In the Spirit or with our own understanding? In the Spirit. See, there's something else we have to learn to major in on doing is praying in the spirit with all manner of prayer and entreat, ent, entreaty. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. Hmm. What then, if anything, is, is Paul trying to show us here? Well, if anything, the importance of our words. That's what he's trying to show us, the importance of our words. Yes. In the maintenance and the direction of our flesh. Maintaining and upholding an awareness, a consciousness, if you will, of the spirit realm. Every time we speak, we must be aware of the spirit realm. Because if we understand that correctly, God said, let there be, so he spoke words, and he spoke with gracious tones, or tones of grace, he spoke from the seed of his love, but those words created. And what we fail to realize is that every time we open our mouths and words fall out, we're creating. Good or bad, we're creating. For God is spirit, John 4, 24. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The words then, or the word truth in the Greek here is the word hmm, alathema, 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 meaning truly in truth. So we must speak truly in truth. And the word for spirit there in the Greek is pan, panuma, or uh, pronounced pneuma, but it was a, is a P, right? A P N Y, pneuma. And this one of its, and one of its meanings here, this word, is that of the divine nature of Christ. So what are we saying here? The word truth in the Greek, we just read that, did we not? Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So the word there for uh, truth is, uh, uh, what did I say? Alathia. Alathia. Alathia, yeah. <laughs> Alathia. Meaning truly in truth. So we've got to speak truly in truth. And then the word for spirit is, is puma. And this one is that of the divine nature of Christ. 
So when we speak, we're speaking as Christ. That's it. So that's why we're going to have to give account of every idle word that we speak when we stand before the Lord. Because we're speaking as, as himself. Now the emphasis here then in Ephesians 6.18 is that we must pray at all times in the Spirit. And then if you'll notice that the word Spirit there is capitalized. The word Spirit there is capitalized. So we're not praying from our spirit. But we're praying from and through the Holy Spirit. Meaning that we're to utilize the power of the Holy Spirit when we pray. We don't realize that, do we? You know, how many of you have gone to a prayer meeting and sat there and had nothing to say? Right, you're racking your brain as if to say, what can I pray about? What shall I say? You know, I've, how many of you have gone to the praying for the city? You know, meeting in different churches and praying for the city. And you go there and they give you a list. Like they are directing the prayer. And if they're directing the prayer, you can pray in the spirit, capital spirit. And if you begin to pray in the Spirit, capital Spirit, they shut you down. We've got to stick to the agenda. Right? Unless, uh, and instead of allowing the Spirit to lead, they quench the Spirit. And nothing changes. Now, all of these words, verses and words that we've, that we've just read suggest then to us that we have a need to understand more clearly the things of the Spirit. Not only when we pray, but as we go throughout our day, we should never disconnect ourselves from the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we need to become more and more aware of a conscious effort of the things of the Spirit. You know, one of the best things to do, and I'm, I'm sure you've learned how to do this, one of the best things to do is say, okay, Lord, here I am. How would you have me pray? How would you have me pray? And what would you have me pray for? So there is a dialogue then that goes on between the spirit and the flesh and vice versa. And that's why we see, as we saw in Colossians 4, 6, that Paul instructs us to have our words seasoned, listen, seasoned with grace. Seasoned with grace. So when our words are with grace seasoned, then we're, in other words, when we're coming from a revelation of grace, I hope you're catching this, when we're coming from a revelation of grace, then we'll know how to answer each and every thing that comes against us. When we're praying from a revelation of grace. So when we pray, right, we need to have our words, what? Seasoned with grace. Seasoned with grace. So if, if we're going to have our words seasoned with grace, we have to understand what grace is. It's not just your auntie, auntie grace. Right? It's something more powerful than that. As powerful as love itself. So we'll need, if we'll know then, we need to answer with joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, or self-control. That's how we need to pray and that's how we need to answer. But we'll need also to be understanding in a revelation of grace. Understanding it all in and from a revelation of God's grace. Now what does that mean? Well, it means the Father God's desire to show in every situation. He wants to show in every situation that we are praying for or that we're believing for or that we're standing for. He wants a, a revelation of the situation to show his favorable regard towards us. 
or to all times. Father God desires to bestow upon us his pleasurable regard at all times because of his love for us. This then needs, it needs the influence of the tones of our voice when we speak to be speaking in tones of grace. We need to know his regard towards us also. We need to know his regard towards us and we need to know how to speak in and with that regard in and through our words when we speak. Can you see that? I has not seen nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. For God so loved the world, he gave. He gave his only begotten son for us so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So can you see how important it is for us then to understand the grace of God, the love of God, before we speak? Because if we don't understand the love of God and the grace of God before we speak, we're speaking from here instead of here. So I, I always used to, I tell, I used to, I've told you before, I always used to ask the Lord when I was having these, all these people bombard me with their questions about why God allowed this to happen, why does God allow that to happen, I would always ask God to fill my mouth with his words or I would say, well, I'll come back to you and I'll give you a, an answer tomorrow. I will seek the counsel of the Holy Spirit and come back to you with an answer. So he always wants to speak to us. He always wants to bestow upon us, upon us his favorable regard. The, as I say, the Father desires to be to bestow upon us his pleasurable regard at all times because of his love for us. So this then needs to influence the tones of our voice when we speak. You have to understand it before you can speak it. To know and not to do is what? Really not yet to know. We need to know his regard towards us and then we need to speak with that regard in and through the words that we speak. Can you see it? Does that make sense to you? Is it making sense to you? This then needs to be the heart perception. We really need to perceive and observe this in our hearts. Identifying the heart of Father God's grace towards us. His favorable regard needs to be a constant influence when we speak. Isn't that phenomenal? Now, Father God wishes to bless us. Amen? I.e. I don't know how I got myself into this financial difficulty. To the Father, it doesn't matter what we did to get into this situation, regardless of what we did, Father God still wishes to bestow upon us his favorable regard. We, now we have this assurance. Turn with me, to, if you will, to Romans 8, 28. We have this assurance in the word of God itself regarding the favorable regard of God. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 28. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into his plan for good to us and for us, for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. So this then explains his friendly disposition towards us. 
So when we are found, when we have found, so when we've found the grace tone, that tone of grace speech, it's then that we're being that we are that we are being instructed by grace. Did you catch that? Did you understand what I just said? Because I messed it up a little bit. Okay, so when we've found the grace tone, or the tones of grace, when we have found it and know how to operate in it, right, it's then that we will be instructed by grace. How many of you know? You see the light above your head? Okay, what's making that light light, light up? The electricity. The electricity, right? But before that electricity can light that light bulb, it has to go through the cable. It has to come from the switch and from the switch to the main source. So you see, when we found the main source of grace, when we understand the main source of where the main source of grace is, then we will be able to speak tones of grace. And when we speak tones of grace, we'll be influenced and operate in God's grace. See that? He is grace. He is grace, yes. But you see, we have to understand that. Not just on the page. Not just in our head. But in our spirit. So we have to understand. We have to understand what grace is. Just like we have to understand what love is. See? We have to understand what these are before we can operate in them and before we can effectively affect our environment and our physical bodies with them, we have to understand them first, where they are and where they come from. So it's then we'll be instructed by grace on how we ought to answer. See it? So turn with me now, if you will, to Mark 4, 38. Hallelujah. We're almost done. I don't want to go for an hour today and 27 minutes. Mark 4.38. Now we've looked at this, this verse of scripture many, many times before, right? <laughs> we've looked at this verse of scripture many, many times before about Jesus being asleep in the back of the boat, right? But it says in 38, but he himself was in the stern of the boat asleep on a leather cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, how many times have you been in a position in your life when you begin to wonder if God really cares? My life right now is in a shambles, God. Don't you care? Alas, most so-called believers at times think this way. First sign of trouble, and they run for the hills. Not to God, but they run for the hills. If you want to know how to react when trouble comes, all you have to do is to look at Job. He stood fast and immovable. Even when his wife said to him, curse God and die. Job 2.9. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your blamelessness and your uprightness? Renounce God and die. Wow. What Job was speaking when he answered and when he spoke. What Job was speaking, he was speaking the truth in love. I mean, he had some beautiful friends, didn't he? And a beautiful wife too. But he spoke the truth in love to the very best of his ability, even under such duress. Now what his friends were speaking was perhaps the truth of the day. What his friends were speaking to him was perhaps the truth of the day, but it wasn't the eternal truth. See that? 
looking at circumstances of his life. They were looking at the circumstances of his life at that moment. Giving value, listen, giving value to those things of that day. Not value to the word, not value to the promise of God, not value to the love of God or the grace of God or the purpose of God, but to the value of the things of that day. Now back to the disciples in the boat. They said, don't you care that we're perishing? Then we see in Mark 4.39, that's the next verse, of course, that Jesus arose and rebuked the wind. Now, if you study the word there for rebuke, because we've got it all mixed up, messed up, you'll find if you dig down deep enough that it means formally to restrain. Formally to restrain. Formally means he had the authority. Formally means that you have the authority in Christ, being in him, to restrain. And there are many of our other assumptions, of our assumptions, that need to be restrained when it comes to speaking in tones of grace. Tones of grace is a language of love that we need to master. Now listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus, what, it, what we read is that Jesus rebuked the wind. He did what? He said. He said. Now, this isn't just someone speaking. This is Jesus, right? So highlight the word said. This also isn't some scholar speaking. This is Jesus. Because I want you to catch this. Now what did the word rebuke mean? Restrain. Formally restrain. Jesus said to the wind, now let's see if we can come up with some context. Jesus, Jesus was speaking because I'm going to give you some context of Jesus said to the wind, right? When Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in John 3, 8, he said to him, the wind blows, breathes, where it wills, and though you hear its sound, yet neither you neither know where it comes from or where it is going, right? So this is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So this is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now here in Mark 4.39, we see Jesus speaking to that of which we, need, we neither know where it comes from or where it is going. Here we see Jesus talking to the wind as though it has ears to hear him. We see that Jesus speaks to the sea and says, peace, be still. As though it has ears to hear him. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now what did Jesus do? Well, he spoke. He said. He said, ask yourselves this question. How did Jesus induce calm and self-control. Now remember this, we've stated this before, that disease is nothing more than health out of control. So what are the severe weather, what are the severe weather patterns? What are the we severe weather patterns? Yes, the sea and the wind are out of control. See, 
Can you see the, the connection here? What I'm saying is here is that Jesus said, he spoke. And what did we say that word said was? To, oh, he said what? To restrain. Let's see if we can, <laughs> I've got to see what myself. To formally restrain. So when he spoke, he restrained the wind and he restrained the sea because he spoke. But how did he speak? Thank you. In tones of grace from the language of love. Well, that's where it comes from. See, see, it's a manifestation. His power and authority is a manifestation of love, right? And what else? Tones of grace. Of love and grace. It's a manifestation of those two things. So he said to us, greater things than these shall you do. Because I go to be with the Father. And the Father will send the comforter, the helper, the leader, the teacher, the guide. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. He's going to lead you in all truth about grace. And he's going to lead you in all truth about love. And we need those truths before we can do those greater things than these shall you do. Because he was speaking from those when he, when he had the total control over the wind and the sea. They are totally subject to him. As a man, they were totally subject to him. And now we're in him. We have exactly the same authority if we understand the love and the grace from which and in which he spoke forth those words. That's right. That's right, Brenda. Absolutely. It's where it comes from. So we have to learn that the words that we speak do not come from here. They do not come from ambition. They do not come from pride. Can you see what I'm saying? They do not come from hatred or resentment. They must come from love and grace before they'll have the power that we're supposed to have and do have over the environment, our own and that around us. I hope you can see that. See, our health is in confusion. See? Because we have not born, or, listen, we're, we, were, we were disease-free. We were not born. When a baby is born, how much disease does it have? None. None. It's born disease-free. So you see, we were, we were born disease-free. Think about that for a moment. Because all things have been built in. All things have within them a, a built-in right, self-correcting mechanism. And if you remember, it is that of repair and adjustment. Repair and adjustment. So we can have... We can have repair and adjustment operating in our lives when we understand love and grace. The reason our cells are out of control is because our health is in confusion. The reason we have all these hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and famines and droughts and fires is because the elements are out of control. They're in confusion because they're, all they're doing is reflecting the words of man. The total contradictive, confusing words of man. Because didn't he say, let us give to them sovereign or total dominion, or dominion, which means total sovereign authority over the air, the sea, and the land. That was before the fall. What came in at the fall? Confusion. What is Babylon? Confusion. Confusion. So, See, so we've been speaking, we've been babbling on 
for centuries, filling the earth with confusion. And what is the earth going to do? It is going to spew out. Isn't that what the scripture says? It will spew out all the words that have been spoken into it. Amen? Now just think this through. Think it through. Think it through. The word of God is the substance of all things. Correct? The word of God is the substance of all things. And all things were completed thoroughly. And God was pleased the seventh day. Yes. Completed thoroughly and perfectly. Completed by what? Love and grace. grace. Now, they were completed thoroughly, including, built in, the capacity of repair and adjustment by the word. What is in your body? What is in every cell of your body? The word. The, every cell in your body contains within it the word of God. Right? <laughs> now think it through and turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews 11.3. Hebrews 11.3. And I'll wrap this up. Because <laughs> we're all at 52 minutes. Hebrews 11.3. By faith. See that? By faith. Not through physics. Astrophysics. Not through science. Not through the ways or the mind of man, but by faith we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose. Yes. By the word of God. So that what we see was not made out of things that were visible. But that's the, what I want you to catch here is, they were equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God. So every cell in your body was constructed for its intended purpose by the word of God. The weather patterns of the earth were created and instructed and intended to be peaceful by the word of God. But it's, it is the word of man that has caused the chaos. Everything that was created, everything that was created was created with the capacity of repair and adjustment. So the word in us is that of the self-correcting capacity of God's creation. Think about that for a while. We'll come back and pick up here next week. Even salvation is by grace. Even salvation is by grace. Exactly right. Exactly right. By the love of God. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father. You've given us a lot to think about once again. And Lord, I pray that this will be played over again and again and again so that we can glean all of the hidden truths and meanings of the word that you have presented us and to us this day. We thank you and praise you for each and every one of them now in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all the people said, Amen, amen and amen. Thank you, Lord.